Coming up on DTNS, Spotify leaps ahead in the streaming music race, Uber Money is now a thing, and lab-grown meat that eats more like a steak. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 28th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm uh, Roger Chang, the show's producer. Sarah Lane is uh, not going to be on the show today. Uh, she is uh, dealing with uh, the fires up in her new area. She moved over the weekend and immediately had to evacuate the area. Uh, she's doing fine. Uh, she is she's safe, uh, but there's there's a lot of logistics to deal with with what's going up on up there right now. So uh, please bear with us uh, as we we get by without Sarah, possibly for for another day or two. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, in the meantime, though, we're very pleased to have senior editor at Engadget, Nicole Lee, joining us on the show. How's it going, Nicole? Hey, how's it going? Happy to be here. Um, hope everything works out well with Sarah and everybody else living in uh, Northern California and California in general. Yeah. Now we were talking a lot about the fires, both down here in Los Angeles and up in San Francisco. Uh, we were also talking about beef and pork. Uh, if you want <laughs> either or both of those conversations and more, of course, subscribe to Good Day Internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Alphabet announced it fell short of analyst estimates for Q3, attributing the miss to increased spending by Google on marketing and hardware deployment. Alphabet reported a net income of $7.07 billion, or $10.12 a share. Analysts had expected $12.44 a share, so that's quite a bit of a miss. Uh, $10.12 a share and $9.19 billion in revenue, compared to $13.06 a share last year. Apple released iOS, iPadOS, and tvOS 13.2 today. Uh, the tvOS version is mainly bug fixes, but iOS 13.2 adds active noise cancellation to Control Center, support for new Unicode 12 emojis, about 230 of those. Uh, the deep fusion feature for iPhone 11s that was shown off in the announcement, as well as the ability to opt out of sharing Siri recordings, as well as delete your old ones. And a delete option is now available when you long press on an icon from the home screen. Friday, the U.S. Department of Defense announced that Microsoft beat out Amazon for the Joint Enterprise Defense Infrastructure, or JEDI, contract, which will see Microsoft work with the Pentagon to modernize infrastructure with cloud services. Microsoft will provide data analysis, host classified military secrets, and secure cloud storage, switch the department to Office 365 software for email and calendar, and it's estimated to bring in about $10 billion to Microsoft over the next decade. Microsoft beat out IBM, Oracle, and significantly Amazon for the contract. Microsoft recently beat out Amazon for an infrastructure deal with Walmart as well. Amazon won a deal with the CIA in 2013 and was expected to win this government contract as well. Amazon may challenge the awarding of the Jedi contract in court. We'll see. An internet attack has knocked out more than 2,000 government and private websites in the country of Georgia and taken that country's national TV network as well as one other TV network off the air. The origin of the attack is unknown, though some websites were replaced with images of Georgia's former president, Mikhail Saakashvili, who gave up his Georgian citizenship in 2015 to become governor of Odessa in Ukraine. Microsoft updated the Xbox All Access plan in the US, UK, and Australia to include an upgrade path for its next generation hardware. Service starts at $20 a month in the US, includes an Xbox One S All Digital Edition bundle, membership to Xbox Live Gold and Xbox Game Pass, with tiers to receive an Xbox One S console for $23 a month, an Xbox One X console for $31 a month. You can also trade in the included Xbox for the next generation Project Scarlet console available at that time top tier after 12 months and for the lower tiers after 18 months. The revised plans will be available starting October 29th in Australia at Telstra, November 5th in the UK at Game and Smith's Toys, and November 18th in the United States from Amazon. And sources tell Reuters Alphabet has made an offer to acquire Fitbit. Uh, Google makes Wear OS but doesn't produce its own wearable hardware. Sources said there's no certainty that the negotiations will lead to a deal, but apparently Google trying to buy Fitbit. We'll see if Fitbit wants to be bought. Right? Something to follow in the future days. All right, let's talk a little more about Apple. Uh, looks like we're not going to get a second uh, announcement from Apple, uh, at least certainly not in October, with only two more days to go. And because Apple announced the launch of AirPods Pro with a press release. AirPods Pro come with three sizes of flexible tips so you can have a better ear fit. 
There's a transparency mode that lets you choose to hear your surroundings, or you can choose to use the built-in noise-canceling microphones to not hear anything in your surroundings. The AirPods Pro cost $249 <coughs> shipping October 30th. Uh, I think a lot of people expected this to be part of a second announcement. Some people thought they might hear it at the September announcement, but uh, mm -hmm. Apple just coming straight to market with this, Nicole. Yeah, and uh, I think it's definitely, so this is my theory, that it's timed to come out the same time as Amazon's earbuds that they announced not too long ago. And Amazon's earbuds, if you will recall, are the same kind of concept of like those true wireless earbuds. Um, and they have, they don't have um, noise canceling, but they do use Bose's um, noise reduction technology in those earbuds. And uh, I, I don't think they're, I have, to look, I have to look at it, but I don't think they're quite as expensive as Apple's models. So Apple maybe is like, oh, ours is better because ours have, you know, noise canceling and you have to, you know, it's blocks out more sound or something so it, it's it sounds as if it's somewhat strategic timing in of when they're releasing it but you know they could have been planning this for months i mean i, I don't really know oh, yeah. but um so I, I imagine there was some flexibility in the timing on this stuff, but but only within a few months, I, I would imagine. Uh, mm -hmm. My guess is they, they just decided they didn't have enough else to announce in October uh, with Apple TV Plus launching November 1st. Uh, and maybe this being the only other thing, maybe that MacBook Pro, that 16-inch rumored MacBook Pro is just it's not ready. Uh, that's just disappointing because I'm sure a lot of us were looking forward to getting a new MacBook. I think you know some of us, I guess me, I guess I'm including really me in that statement, um, are not really happy with the current uh, generation of MacBook Pros, the keyboard complaints and all of mm -hmm, those things. So mm -hmm. I was really looking forward to a new MacBook Pro and maybe they'll squeeze one out before the end of the year, but it doesn't seem like it. It's already in November and then December and then there's the new year. So... Yeah, it doesn't look like it. Maybe they'll have a, like a March event or something, like a spring. Event, yeah, they they, they often do for like a, oh, for an okay. iPhone SE. Uh, so so maybe yeah. they would announce a new laptop then. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so maybe, or maybe they'll just come straight to us with the press release. So I don't yeah. mind that. That that's I mean, fine. I, that's fine. I don't yeah. I don't need a big old event. So, yeah. um, this AirPods like I am. It'd be, it's interesting to me because they're like a hundred dollars more more or less right mm -hmm. than the current iteration and whether or not that's whether or not the the features of the noise canceling and all of those things whether that's enough uh to persuade people to pay the hundred dollar premium for that those features I'm, I'm not sure if they are but i don't know what your thoughts are on that yeah they are <laughs> it's apple <laughs> okay. uh apple 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 fans aren't terribly price sensitive and this isn't outrageous yeah, okay. uh so i'm guessing yeah you're going to see a lot of people snap these things up and and they're still selling the original AirPods if somebody yeah. doesn't want to pay that much. So I, I think Apple will be fine with this, to be honest. Spotify reported subscribers rose to 113 million by the end of September. This is bad news for Apple. Uh, it says it is adding roughly twice as many subscribers per month as Apple Music. Spotify also reported earnings of 36 cents a share. Analysts had expected Spotify to report a loss of 29 cents a share. Uh, <laughs> revenue rose 28%. That just beat expectations. But I guess Spotify must have cut, kept costs down more than was expected uh, because analysts had expected a loss on the, about the same amount of revenue. Uh, overall, though, this is, this is great news for Spotify. They're going gangbusters. Yeah, and I've heard, I've seen reports saying that some of the investment in podcasts were actually was really helpful on Spotify's end of things. Um, it seems so, anyway. Yeah, no, they were they were attributing a lot of the uptake or a lot of the the uh, at least the usage uh, of that of that subscription level to the fact that they had a lot of podcasts and they're getting a lot of people using podcasts. So it's a it's a yeah. little bit of uh, circumstantial evidence, I suppose, but it seems yeah. to make sense. And also, I feel like Spotify just has that, I guess, legacy because they've been around longer and that's, that usually helps with these kinds of things. And Apple Music, you know, for a long time, they weren't compatible with a lot of other services or other devices that you couldn't play Apple Music on your Alexa or whatever, like or whatever it was. Right. And that maybe have that they maybe like limited the usage or uptake on apple music so yeah i think that's part of it's part of its perception right a lot yeah. of people don't realize that you can get apple music on things that aren't made by apple at right. all and even then people are like 
Well, I guess I've heard you could get it on Android. And did I hear it's on the Echo? Is it on the Google Home? No, I don't think it's on the Google Home. Can, or is it? Can I get it on Windows? Like, yeah. Spotify, there's no question. People are like, oh, yeah, I can get Spotify. doesn't matter yeah, what there's, Spotify there's, is. There's a little bit of mixed messaging and there's confusion. And I think Apple just does not seem to get their marketing right in terms of when it comes to music and devices. So, I mean, in a way, I understand it because they want to market their own thing. <laughs> they want to sell HomePods and they want to sell, like, you know, yeah, iPhones. Yeah. So I understand it, but also, like, it's not great for the services. Well, and if Apple needs to pivot to services, which it has said it does, then it needs to not be sacrificing uptake uh, for selling hardware. That's, that's yeah. some. And we're seeing them doing that with the Apple TV app coming to Roku and Fire yeah, TV yeah, OS, yeah. but it just doesn't have that perception yet. Yeah. Uber announced a new division called Uber Money. No, it's not a <laughs> cryptocurrency. Thank uh, goodness. <laughs> the new division Uber Money is making a digital wallet uh, as well as handling the debit and credit cards that Uber already offers. The idea is to provide bank account options for drivers worldwide. Uber has been testing a no-fee debit card in the U.S. and a few other markets. It has something with that called Instant Pay, which is now used for about 70% of driver payments in the U.S. The idea is you can spend the money you made that day on your Uber routes immediately with that debit card. Uh, these products are not aimed at riders, mm -hmm. though Uber says it believes it might expand these sort of products to riders in the future. Uber has also been testing offering microloans to drivers in Brazil, India, and Peru. Uh, a microloan would be like, I need a loan to fill up with gas at the beginning of the day so that then I can go and drive around and make money to pay back that loan and hopefully a little extra by the end of the day. Uh, and the Uber wallet will be made available for both drivers and riders to store uh, money in and integrated with Apple Pay and Google Pay. So what? So what's the benefit of me using an Uber wallet versus those other options you mentioned, like Apple yeah. Pay and Android? Pay? It's most <laughs> for the drivers, right? Yeah, if I, yeah, if yeah. my payment comes into Uber Wallet and then I can spend that out to Apple Pay immediately, which is what they're saying I can do, or Google right. Pay, uh, right. that's a huge advantage. Like I, I immediately see the advantages to drivers. Mm. Maybe I don't know if there's points that would that I could acquire in the wallet. Uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, you know building up a credit in there for faster payment. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm not seeing the rider advantage as much here and and to uber's credit that's not where they're targeting uber money right now right and honestly it, it does sound like it makes a lot more sense perhaps in drivers in areas where maybe they have a harder time going through the traditional banking routes like you mentioned right. some of these other countries so in that sense it's a little easier it's a little bit more seamless to use this uber money option versus a traditional banking option yeah, I know uh, the, in a few countries, but uh, Pakistan is the one I remember off the top of my head. Uh, cash payments are the most popular way to do Uber. And right. you may not even realize in some countries that cash payments are even offered by Uber. Right. But in some places, you wouldn't be able to offer Uber service without it. Uh, so there's a system that allows you to pay for your Uber with cash. And Uber does that because they need to in order to operate in those areas, but they'd rather not. Uh, so so getting drivers <laughs> banked and maybe, yeah, and maybe that that explains the rider part of it too. Uh, maybe if riders can transfer some money into an Uber wallet because they don't have Apple Pay, Google Pay, or even a credit card. A credit card but they even, could, right. Yeah, but they could transfer money in there. That, that could help riders in those situations too. It's kind of like a, not really a cryptocurrency, but kind of the digital cash. It's an option. Basically. It's, it reminds me quite a bit of WeChat. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the Chinese app where you have to have a Chinese bank account to do this, but but people use it to just store money and pay for things constantly, whether whether they've got money stored in WeChat or not. But it's something they can do if they want to. So uh, I think it's smart for Uber to get into that because they they seem to have plans to become more than just a ride hailing app. Uh, and certainly having don't call them uh, a ride healing up. They're very they're uber sensitive about yeah, that. They, they want to be a platform for for That's not right. and not even just for transportation for for lots of things. So, so having paying, a finance part of that is important. Imagine paying for your Uber Eats with your Uber right. money. Right. And then, you know, after that's been around for a while, then you might start to be able to pay for other things with sure. your Uber wallet. That's how WeChat started, right? It used to just be about transferring to your friends and then shops started to take it and then you're off to the races. NVIDIA launched two new Shield TV boxes running Android TV, both run on the faster Tegra X1 Plus processors. Uh, NVIDIA says they're about 25% faster than the Tegra 
previous processors. Uh, the Shield TV boxes both have Ethernet, micro SD, and support for Dolby Vision HDR. NVIDIA now upscales HD to look closer to 4K when necessary. The new Pro version of the Shield TV has twice the storage of the other version, so 16 gigabytes uh, and it has three gigabytes of RAM. The regular new NVIDIA Shield TV has two gigabytes of RAM. The Pro also comes with two USB 3.0 ports and can support Plex Media Server. The Shield TV Pro costs $200, and the regular new Shield TV costs $150. I will turn to our producer, Roger Chang, now, who is uh, among us, I believe, the most enthusiastic supporter of the Shield TV. Roger, you love your Shield TV, don't you? Uh my shield tv because it that's um it's possibly one of the best android purchases i've made in a while yeah well it is definitely the premier android tv box out there there's a lot mm -hmm. There's a lot of Android TV boxes out there. I have a channel master that runs Android. But, Roger, as you were saying in our pre-show, they're, they're kind of quirky, and they're all basically underpowered, whereas Shield TV, even your old Shield TV, you say, run, runs very smooth. So one of the, one of the things about uh, the Shield TV was that it was kind of a device that was originally supposed to be a portable gaming handheld. And that, yes. And that didn't really take off as well as NVIDIA wanted. But they managed to create a set-top Android TV device out of it using the innards. Um, and it's proved to be extremely popular with DIY home theater uh, enthusiasts because it allows you to run anything that runs mostly on Android, even if it means side loading. But a lot of people run Plex Media Server, a lot of people run uh, Kodi off of it. And it's proved incredibly robust. I've managed to run not just all my shooting apps. Um, but it's also allowed me to access a lot of my uh, online, or not online, but uh, online storage uh, content. Uh, and you know what? You know, outside of you know being a, a great console to play retro video games on, it really is seamless. Like there's enough horsepower in it that it does everything pretty well. Like it's not like you're not going to play, you know, you place all your content well. You can access all your content in some fashion very well. And I'm amazed that they're not and they're not more competitors to the Android Shield or uh, the Nvidia Shield. Nicole, have you used the Shield much? Or have you played around with that? No, I mean, I'm familiar with the Android TV platform. Um, and uh, it's always it's always been interesting to me on why Android TV hasn't does it doesn't seem to be as top of mind for people as let's say a Roku or even a Fire TV box, which is you know pretty popular, I think. And um, I wonder if because there is that perception that Nvidia Shield is a gamer thing, and I wonder if there is still a little bit of a adoption issue with like the whole Android TV name. I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but you know, I've I've played around with it. I've used it. It does seem like a very user friendly interface. Um, it does. It co it's compatible with almost every other. It's compatible with like Hulu. It's compatible with you know YouTube TV and all of the the services that you want on your uh, set top box. Uh, but yeah, like, and I, I love that you can use, you can see like, hey, Google, turn on this and turn off that. And that's really good to use like your voice to control things. And so I don't know. I, I, it, it'll be interesting to see to, for me to see if like, like this new Android, this new, this new Shield TV Pro, if that will take off in any way. Yeah, it's almost like NVIDIA runs into the same problem as Apple, where people perceive this to be a game box. In fact, someone immediately was like, yeah, but can this play GeForce now? Like, that's what people <laughs> think, rather yeah. than comparing it to an Apple TV, for instance, because it's similarly priced. And GeForce now works really well if you have a decent uh, internet connection, um, because I've played at least five titles on it, and it's pretty seamless. It works pretty pretty darn well. You know what hasn't worked perfectly yet is lab-grown meat. It's a potential meat alternative. Uh, this one's made from actual animal cells. It's not like the Beyond Burger or Impossible Burger, which is made mm -hmm. of plant-based substitutes. Lab-grown meat says, we'll make actual meat, but we'll just grow it in a dish so, it, so we're not actually affecting any animals. Uh, the problem is... The cells, when you grow them in a lab, don't have the collagen that you have in your natural muscle tissue. So mm -hmm. instead of being those nice striated fibers, lab-grown meat ends up kind of mushy. Well, scientists at Harvard University tried growing cow and rabbit muscle cells on a scaffolding made of food-safe gelatin, 
uh, that was spun into fibers and bonded to the cells using enzymes so that they could just scoop it up and it would have more of that fibrous structure. Scale's still an issue for this uh, before this becomes a practical alternative to steak, but they made some progress. Uh, they basically said that the, the consistency is somewhere between a burger and a steak. So they're getting mm. closer. Uh, a lab-grown burger right now uh, is kind of mushy, and the company that is most famous uh, for the th like $350,000 uh, lab-grown burger says they think they can get their burger available for $10 by 2021. That's still way more expensive than a Beyond Burger or an Impossible Burger. Sure. So this isn't practical yet, but <laughs> they're making progress towards being able to just grow actual meat. Now, there's questions about whether this actually confers a health disadvantage because, you know, eating plant-based materials can be considered healthier, although there's a lot of oil in these Beyond yeah. Impossible burgers, so maybe there's some room for debate there. But it certainly isn't using the rainforest, you know, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not using uh, the, the land uh, to, to be grown. And uh, if they can get it to scale, it wouldn't, wouldn't be harming any actual animals, right? Yeah, and I think it's really interesting, right? Like what, like what, what do you, what do we think when we think of sustainability? Um, you know, Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, their big point is that you know it's it doesn't it doesn't burn as much greenhouse gases to make our to grow our soy or to grow our wheat proteins or whatever it is, and that's probably the case. But uh, would growing meat in a lab, would that use far less greenhouse gases? Maybe. I mean, I don't know what their processes are. Perhaps it's just like, you know, doing things in the test tube or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know the process there. Uh, maybe it's not as strenuous and maybe that will be less um, carbon offsets, that kind of thing. But I also want to think about like, I wonder like if you're a vegetarian, does that change your mind? Like, would you like, would you eat meat? If it was not from an animal, I've <laughs> heard all kinds. Of, I've heard all kinds of answers to that, and and that is one really <laughs> important part about this particular uh, development is food safe gelatin is made from animals. So right. if you are a vegetarian, that is very strict about those sorts of things like gelatin, you will not want to eat this lab grown meat because it has sure. gelatin. So you're you are having to harm an animal to get the gelatin. Uh, and, <laughs> and so it kind of undermines one of the, you know, it saw, it makes that question easier to answer for a vegetarian. Whereas if the gelatin was synthetic and, and maybe they'll come up with a food safe maybe. version that's synthetic, uh, then, then we're back to that conundrum of like, well, I'm not, <laughs> it's not actually meat, but it's kind of the meat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, for me, it'll be interesting to see whether they can get the cost down because I you know that cost is still an important consideration. Oh, that's a huge, yeah. Yeah, I mean, ten dollars is a lot of money for a burger. No, uh, this goes from being a novelty uh, at ten dollars to to being if it can be cheaper than beef, then all the people who are saying they're disgusted oh, yeah. and they prefer real meat will go right for it. But it has to be cheaper yeah. for that to happen. It has to be cheaper, and it has to taste good. You know, like other oh, those are the two oh, yeah. options. So it's got to have um, that consistency, right? <laughs> right. China has passed new regulations for cryptography that should go into effect January 1st, 2020. The law requires attention uh, to secrets uh, to use core and common encryption. So state secrets, anybody, any institution that's protecting state secrets must use core and common encryption. Institutions working on encryption must establish management systems that guarantee security, though state managers will not be allowed to ask for exclusive info like source code. There are some limits on that. The new law also encourages commercial development and use of encryption, but such products, quote, must not harm the state's security and public interest. So while the state institutions can't automatically demand the source code, on the other hand, in China anyway, if you're making a commercial product, there's a lot of wiggle room for you not to be able to do end-to-end -end encryption because you must not harm state security and public interests. Uh, and you cannot offer any kind of encryption as a commercial product to consumers without approval of the state. The law was announced at the same time as reports that China's central bank is closer to launch of its own digital currency. Uh, this was something that Mark Zuckerberg mentioned uh, in his testimony to the U.S. Congress about Libra last week. Uh, Monday at Shanghai, the head of the People's Bank of China's technology department, Li Wei, urged commercial banks to step up their application of blockchains to finance. And... The People's Bank of China proposals are very similar to Libra, except they're state managed, whereas Libra was going to be managed by a collection of private companies. 
Yeah, uh, you know, I think it'll, it's, it, it'll be interesting to see what China does going forward with the cri- cryptography, because though they have not a great history uh, with, you know, privacy and security, it, 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 they're not known for respecting privacy as much, I guess that's kind of the That the seems thing. to be the, the common opinion of China, <laughs> but you right. will get a different answer if you ask people in China. People in China right. feel like their privacy is protected. It's an interesting right. conundrum because it's, it is... <laughs> somewhat objective there there is less privacy from the state in china objectively but it's also mm-hmm. sometime somewhat cultural where people go yeah but i also want that's okay but i want certain privacy to still be protected it's a really interesting situation i do yeah. uh, i i do think um, that it i, I oh, think yeah go ahead no, I, I was about to say that uh, it's interesting that the comparison with Libra was also interesting to me as far as, you know, because Libra is not looking so hot right now without everything pulling out. But uh, so maybe maybe China's doing the going the right route here. I think Ch- for, for China, for the government of China, coming up with a state run cryptocurrency that makes uh, payment systems faster and cheaper is a great idea. That's why Libra wants to exist, is to make payment systems faster and cheaper. And China can make it happen within its borders. Whether it'll get accepted outside of China's borders, I, I find highly unlikely. Um, oh. That's, you know, even though Zuckerberg's trying to raise it as a scare threat. But it is, whether, whether people allow Libra to do it or not, I, I think somebody will and probably should be allowed to try some kind of system like this uh, worldwide. And uh, yeah. I'll be interested to see if anybody fills in the gap of Libra or if, or if Libra can resurrect itself from the almost dead, which is kind of where it is right now. Right, exactly. <laughs> Hey, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to DailyTechHeadlines.com. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at DailyTechNewsShow.reddit.com and Facebook.com slash group slash DailyTechNewsShow. We check in with the mailbag uh, because we had so many great responses from folks about why they might want to speed up or slow down Netflix playback based on the story on Friday that Netflix is testing such options for folks. Laurent and Byron both want to speed up video uh, to fit in more watching for different reasons. One of them has a kid. One, one just wants to fit in more on the train. Matt speeds up Netflix with a Chrome extension when he's evaluating a pilot episode or he hits a particularly slow episode in a series. If he's like, I just want to get through this part. Uh, Allison Sheridan pointed out that slowing down is great for instructional videos. If you're uh, you know, doing a software install or fixing a toilet and you're looking at a YouTube video, it's always good to just slow it down so you can catch it instead of having to constantly rewind. Professor Metcalf says slowing down videos of his lectures helps English as a second language students retain more info. And he also noticed that speeding up videos of his lectures helped people with English as their first language retain more info. So it all it all depended on where you sat. Uh, Jay said he would like to slow down fight scenes in martial arts shows <laughs> so he can just see all the <laughs> strategies and the impacts. Uh, a little whoosh slow down there. I love that. Uh, and Kevin and Phil were among people who speed up so videos so they don't get distracted uh, for, for multiple reasons. So thank you, everybody. Uh, for for sharing all these wonderful reasons, uh, there's I've got so many examples now of why you might want to speed up or slow down a Netflix video. Nicole, uh, does it occur to you that you would want to use this feature if they rolled it out widely? It depends on the show. If it's like a really slow moving documentary, maybe uh, I might want to just speed it up a little bit so that speed up past the boring bits. <laughs> the uh, of, the, the animal gonna... attack. <laughs> I don't know, and then you can. I don't know about speeding up. Speeding up is the one I'm not entirely sure whether I would do, but slowing down, I can I can see the point. You know, when you can you know slower so I can hear what's going on. But I'm not sure about speeding up. Well, folks, thank you for sharing. Keep on sharing your insights at feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Brad Schick. Dr. Carmine M. Bailey and Mike McLaughlin. And thanks again to Cole Lee for joining us. No problem. Well, if people want to find out what you're up to, because I know you got lots of holiday gift guides coming up at Engadget and stuff like that, where should they go? Yeah, so uh, we have tons of buying guides, gift guides coming up. Uh, go to Engadget.com. We'll probably roll them out sometime in probably end of November, something like that, to, for all your Black Friday shopping needs. 
<laughs> it occurs to me that you have a long history of helping out with holiday gift guides for technology outlets. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, these these should be pretty good since Nicole is involved in them. You, you, <laughs> okay, great. You're going to have to check them out, folks. Uh, also, we have a new Patreon reward. We have several new Patreon uh, rewards. If you've never used our Patreon, you can get a commercial-free version of the show, uh, both DTNS or Good Day Internet. Uh, but also, if you sign up right now at the $2 level or above, you will get a PDF copy of the official DTNS cookbook with recipes from the show hosts and even some listeners. Uh, so go sign up right now. If you're at the old dollar level, uh, you might want to increase to the $2 level in the next couple of days so you can get that cookbook. That's patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. You can find out more about that at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Got a little change in the schedule. Scott Johnson will be with us tomorrow and then Patrick Beja on Wednesday. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>